This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during December. In this episode, we'll mark the solstice, be amazed by Mars, prep for this year's very best meteor shower, and welcome the arrival of winter's bright stars. So grab your curiosity and a warm coat and come along on this month's Sky Tour. I'm a Californian who ended up in New England, and I am not a big fan of cold, snowy winters. So I'll rejoice when it's 4.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on December 21st. That will mark this month's celestial turnaround point, the solstice. This Latin word means sun stands still. At that moment, the sun has traveled its farthest south in the sky, shining directly down on Earth's Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere, and then reverses its direction to gradually move northward among the stars. Weather-wise, this date marks the astronomical beginning of summer in the southern hemisphere, and of winter up here in the north. For those of us at mid-northern latitudes, around this solstice, the span from sunset to sunrise is at least 14 hours. That's great for stargazing, of course, but a little depressing if you love being out in the sunshine like me. Meanwhile, the moon starts this month near first quarter, then fills out completely, called the full cold moon, rather obviously, on the night of December 7th. That date is celestially special this year, as I'll explain in a moment. Last quarter moon follows on the 16th, new moon on the 23rd, and first quarter on December 29th. So, to calibrate your internal celestial clock, you'll have the moon in the evening sky during the first and last weeks of this month. We've been ooing and aahing over the sun's largest planets, Jupiter and Saturn, for a few months now. They've been parading prominently across the evening sky, and they're still in view, though Saturn is well past its prime. Start your search as soon as it gets dark. Face where the sun set, and make a left turn to face south. In that part of the sky, halfway to overhead, you'll have no trouble spotting the gleaming beacon that is Jupiter. It's less than half as bright now as it was just two months ago, but even so, it's brighter than any of the stars around it, by far. The moon slides very close by Jupiter on the evening of December 1st. Now shift your gaze from Jupiter toward the lower right, about halfway back to the sunset point, and you'll encounter Saturn. It's far less bright than Jupiter, but you should have no trouble spotting it unless you have horrible light pollution, and then it might take a few moments to spot it. Also, don't wait too long to track down Saturn, because it ducks below the southwestern horizon by around 8 p.m. or thereabouts. So, while Jupiter and Saturn are still around to enjoy, this month the planetary spotlight definitely shifts over to the east, where you'll find the red planet Mars climbing into view soon after it gets dark. In fact, Mars reaches opposition, the point in the sky opposite the Sun, on December 7th. Opposition also means that Earth and Mars are their closest together in space, and so Mars is shining its brightest. Now you'll recall that the full cold moon is also on the night of the 7th, and when it's full, the moon is also at opposition, more or less. So, I can hear you thinking, are the moon and Mars close together in the sky? Oh yes, most definitely. In fact, that very night, the moon will slide right over Mars in what's called an occultation, a spectacular celestial event that will be visible from much of North America. Here in the contiguous U.S., the cover-up will be visible north of a line that runs roughly from Dallas, Texas, toward northeast across central Kentucky and Pennsylvania, and through Massachusetts. Anyone south of that line will see Mars skim oh so very close to the moon's southern edge. And while you can certainly watch this event even by eye, it'll be even more spectacular when seen through binoculars or a small telescope. Now, a lunar cover-up of Mars isn't an exceedingly rare nighttime event. It happens about every 14 years. But it'll definitely be worth heading outside to watch. Again, that's on the evening of December 7th, if your weather permits. But wait, there's more. 
The other two bright planets, Mercury and Venus, are peaking above the southwestern horizon this month. The best time to look will be the last week or so of December. You'll need a completely clear view towards southwest and start looking about 30 minutes after sunset. Venus will be quite low down but very bright, and Mercury will be just to its upper left. If you manage to spot them in the deepening dark, then let your gaze slide even farther to the left to sweep up Saturn, then Jupiter, and finally Mars way over in the east. And congrats, that's a five-fecta of bright planets. December also features the return of what's arguably the very best meteor shower all year, the Geminids. From a clear, dark location, far from strong sources of light pollution and moonlight, you might see one meteor per minute or more when it peaks on the night of December 13th. This year, viewing conditions are pretty good, with the waning gibbous moon and its intrusive light out of view until 9 or 10 p.m. By then, Gemini will already be well up and the show of shooting stars should already be underway. So why do we see these particular meteors every December like clockwork? Meteor showers happen when our planet plows through a stream of fine particles that have been shed by a comet and spread out along its orbit. Earth crosses the Geminids' orbit each December. But these meteors are unusual. Their source isn't a comet, but an asteroid called Phaethon. Phaethon isn't very large, only about three miles across, and it was discovered fairly recently, in 1983. Before then, no one knew where the Geminids came from. Phaethon's most remarkable distinction is that it approaches the Sun closer than any other named asteroid. Its orbital perihelion is only 13 million miles from the Sun. That's less than half of Mercury's perihelion distance, and it means temperatures can climb to more than 1300 degrees Fahrenheit. Astronomers think Phaethon is a body whose rocky minerals start cracking and breaking down into dust as the searing sunlight heats its surface. The sun's radiation pressure then drives them off into space. And when some of those particles slam into our atmosphere at 22 miles per second, bam, we get a nice cascade of shooting stars. Wow, our solar system is really putting on quite a show this month. But what about the stars overhead? Remember them? Early in December, once it gets good and dark, say around 7 p.m., the majestic stars of Orion veritably leap up over the eastern horizon. By month's end, those same stars come into view a couple of hours earlier, soon after sunset. Look for the hunter's distinctive belt of three stars, oriented as a vertical row as the constellation climbs into the sky. The belt is flanked by two bright stars, ruddy Betelgeuse to its left and icy white Rigel to its right. Now clench your fist and hold it at arm's length. Then go one fist to the right of Mars, where you'll spot a modestly bright star showing the slightest hint of red color. This is Aldebaran, the angry eye of Taurus the bull. It's a red giant star, about 44 times the sun's diameter and more than 500 times its brightness. Aldebaran doesn't seem that bright because it's 65 light years away. The light from Aldebaran that's hitting your eye right now left that star in 1957, when Dwight Eisenhower was President of the United States and the Soviet Union had just recently launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. Aldebaran has been known by many names over time. Ancient Persians knew it as Tasheter, and the Romans called it Parilisium. If you lived in the Middle Ages, you might have used Kor Tori, meaning Heart of the Bull. Hindu astronomers know it as the lunar mansion Rohini, meaning the red one. The name Aldebaran is Arabic for the follower. And what is it that this star is following? That would be the Pleiades, seen higher up in the evening sky by about the width of one fist. It's a small fuzzy spot, but look harder and you'll realize that it's actually a little cluster of stars, small enough to cover with the tip of your little finger. How many individual stars can you count in this cluster? Five or six? Seven? Another name for the Pleiades is the Seven Sisters, and I'll have more to say about them next month. But get this, the Japanese call this cluster Subaru. Yep, just like the car. In fact, next time you see a Subaru on the street, check out the logo. It's a stylized star cluster. Aha! There's one other star to mention in this part of the evening sky. Well to the cluster's left, about three-fifths away, is Capella, derived from the Latin word for goat. This is the brightest star in the constellation Auriga, 
a mythological charioteer who doubles as a goat herder. Thanks for letting me expand your celestial horizons for another month. If you want more tips on viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed listening, please leave a rating or a review. I love getting your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society. And it's produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, we'll spend some quality time with the Pleiades. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>